Have you seen what's happening in your sanctuary lately? Join us right now for another episode of Your Sanctuary, a program that highlights what makes our National Marine Sanctuary so special and the people that keep them that way. Hello, welcome back. My name is Steve Elzey. I'm the CEO for Your Sanctuary Productions. We now have someone from the sanctuary in the studio, Chad King, who is a research scientist. Chad, welcome to the program. Thanks, Steve. Nice to be here. And I said research scientist. <laughs> you work for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, mm -hmm. and you are one of their research scientists. And it's not like they have an entire building full, <laughs> right? There's not a lot of you over there. No, there's not a whole lot. We mm -hmm. do have a research team. There's uh, mm -hmm. about four and a half of us or so. Okay. But we've all been there, you know, very low turnover. We love our job. I I've been there 16 years, wow. and I'm the young one on the team. I know. <laughs> I'm the one that has been there the least. So I think it says something to, their, to our commitment and the job that we're doing and kind of the environment we work in. Yes, well, I've always found everyone over there very, very passionate, and obviously about the ocean. Mm -hmm. And what a great environment to be able to work, work in. T today, let's talk about the Davidson Seamount expedition that you took recently. Mm -hmm. uh, tell the folks a little bit about where Davidson Seamount is, and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we'll go from there. So Davidson Seamount is an extinct volcano, but it's underwater. Now, it last erupted. No one has to worry about anything <laughs> happening here. It last erupted about 9.8 million years ago or so. Mm -hmm. It's 70 miles southwest of Monterey here, about 80 miles uh, off the coast of, of Cambria. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit offshore. It's kind of out there. Uh, but what's really special about this place is that it's about as tall as the Sierra Nevada. It's about 8,000 feet tall, but the summit is still 4,000 feet below the ocean surface. <laughs> so you can imagine it's, it's fairly deep. No light is down there. Uh, but we think it's an important place, not only because on the surface of the mountain, by the way, it's 26 miles by 8 miles wide. Okay, so wow. it's a fairly large mountain. It could fit in the entire Monterey Bay, kind of from Santa Cruz to Monterey, wow. to give you kind of perspective on how long it is. Mm -hmm. But down below, uh, it harbors a lot of deep sea, uh, long-lived corals and sponges. And so it's really important for kind of the oasis of life it provides, because a lot of the surrounding seafloor isn't like that. Uh, and then secondly, it actually provides a, uh, an area for deep water currents that deflect off of the seamount itself, mm -hmm. and that pushes a bunch of the cold nutrient-rich water to the surface, which then makes that available for the entire food chain. And so often we see a lot more life over the seamount itself. Sure, okay, and, and, and which is one reason why you go out there and, and study, and there's so much to study. Were there objectives of this for, for this mm -hmm. particular expedition? Yeah, so this uh, last expedition we went out there was in July, and mm -hmm. it was about 10 days and it was on the NOAA ship Bell M. Shimada. It's a fishery services vessel. Researchers with the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary are used to doing research off of a roughly 65-foot boat, but now and then the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration provides a bigger vessel. This year we were able to get 10 days of ship time on the 225 feet long uh, NOAA ship Bell M. Shimada. So this gives us an opportunity to do uh, sanctuary work that's way offshore. The Shimada costs about $30,000 a day to run, so researchers are making the most of their time. This year, they're focusing on the Davidson Seamount, an area about 80 miles southwest of Monterey that is rich with sea life. But this particular project, we're looking at prey availability for marine mammals and seabirds, and that's primarily krill and fishes. And so we're looking to relate the amount of prey or food that's out there with the number of mammals and seabirds that we see on the surface. To help look for those, the Bellum Shimada is equipped with a rare device. This TV is displaying essentially a picture of the seafloor and anything between the ship and the seafloor. Uh, it's using sonar, it's called an echo sounder, an EK-60, and we primarily use this to look for layers of prey. They'll actually produce a reflection of sound waves back to the boat. This research team is halfway through their trip and while researchers come and go, the crew mostly remains the same. 
Commanding Officer Jesse Stark says the most unique thing about this ship, the variety of work they can do. This ship, every project's different. So pretty much every time we pull into port, we're destaging gear, scientific personnel, and getting ready to do a new project. The Shimada will head back to San Francisco to dock on Tuesday. Now, we don't really have much of a research budget here at the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. However, we do have access to these very large, wonderful NOAA ships that are state-of-the-art, outfitted with all the latest technology in marine research. And mm -hmm. so we apply for ship time every year, and we get it every couple or three years. And so this gives us the ability to go out there and actually study a lot of the things going on out there. So this particular mission, man, we had so much going on. Mm. During the day, we had trained professional observers looking for marine mammals and seabirds and counting them mm -hmm. so we know where they are. We've mostly been seeing fin whales, and we've had a number of pods of short beak common dolphins. Just saw our first Pacific white side dolphin. Billy, when you're ready, a flow by eye, bearing three, two, zero, reticle three, fin whale, traveling, one, one, one. Animal by binocular, bearing zero, 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 reticle two, Short beak common dolphin traveling. Short beak common dolphins. Let's go with initially 17, 22, 20. Uh, we've been seeing black footed albatrosses pretty regularly in very, very sm in small numbers, ones and twos coming by the ship uh, all day long. The most abundant bird on the Davidson Seamount has been Cassin's Offlet. Uh, two Cassin's Offlets, zone three sitting. We've seen them pretty regularly on both sides of the Seamount and aggregating on the west side in small groups. Guadalupe Merlet, two, zone one, sitting. And this kind of tells us where the hot spots of food are. Oh. Because there's more we've been finding. This is only, what, the third or fourth time we visited the seamount to study the surface. Mm -hmm. So as you can understand, we're still just beginning to paint a picture sure. of what it's like out there. Mm -hmm. But then we had other amazing tools to uh, use sonar or echo sounder to image the prey that's available, mainly oh. krill for the marine mammals and seabirds. But we also did a lot of toes to see the plankton in there, mm -hmm. the fishes. Uh, we also did a lot of human health surveys. We tested or we trawled for microplastics, which is a big issue wow. that I'm sure you've heard about. We sample microplastics using a manta trawl. A manta trawl samples water and floating particles from the surface of the ocean. The contents of the net are washed down into the cod end and stored to be sorted at the lab. Microplastics are a threat to marine life because pollutants stick to their surface. Microplastics enter the food web by being consumed by small filter feeding organisms such as copepods, krill, and forage fish. As well as persistent organic pollutants. And those are things like DDT, PCBs, flame retardants, mm -hmm. anything that basically doesn't degrade naturally in the environment. Mm -hmm. And we want to see the connection of how far offshore these pollutants are going mm -hmm. and rel in, in relationship to how uh, concentrated they are near shore, kind of where they're coming into the sanctuary. Thank you, Chad, and, and for a great explanation. And, and I love the way that you, you take those difficult scientific concepts and just lay them <laughs> out so a chucklehead like me can understand them. I appreciate that. Try it. <laughs> and, and, now, you say tow. Uh, that means you're t talk uh, a little bit about towing to mm -hmm. collect uh, uh, data. Yeah, we don't dip our tail in the water, although it's a little <laughs> cold out there. No, we, do, we have these big nets, basically, mm -hmm. kind of different sizes. And mm -hmm. it's a different tool for any, you know, for, for different applications. So one okay. of them was a very large. Uh, trawl or net mm -hmm. called a tucker trawl and we would put that um, hang it off the side of the ship and actually kind of dip it about 400 500 meters below the surface so more than a thousand feet wow 
and then we let it sit there for about 10 to 15 really minutes. Mm -hmm. Basically anything that kind of comes in the net gets concentrated into a little caught end, is okay. what we call it, a little end on the net. Mm -hmm. So we can take that up and now it's filled with all the stuff that's gone through there. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have smaller nets that go to shallower depths just mm -hmm. to target different things in the water. Mm -hmm. And so those are the two main nets that we used on this trip. And, the, and the, as far as the water columns that you were studying, was it a specific, was it surface, midwater, mm -hmm. what, what, what area? Yeah, so uh, most of it was the surface, but mm -hmm. like I said, the nets, one went to about four or 500 meters, okay. one went to about 100 meters. Mm -hmm. We also used another tool called a CTD, mm -hmm. and that stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. And so basically this is just a big thing that we put down in the water, and it can go to 2,000 meters. It can go you know, more than a couple miles deep. Oceanographers measure fundamental water column properties with a conductivity, temperature, and depth instrument, or CTD. These parameters help us identify different water masses by their densities and also give us the context in which to interpret the biology we see. A CTD is typically paired with one or more Niskin bottles that collect water from depth. Water samples can be analyzed for physical or chemical parameters for data on nutrient, ocean acidification, and more. Changes in parameters like temperature and oxygen affect biology at all levels. We went to about 500 meters in the water column, so this is looking at all the temperature, salinity, okay. how much chlorophyll there is, mm -hmm. and a few other parameters in the water column. So we drop that every so often along these lines that we kind of mow the lawn is what we call it, ah, yes. over the seamount. Um, and so it was a very regimented scientific approach. But you know, kind of when you put dots together that start to form a picture, one of those dot pictures, mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're trying to do in okay. terms of scientific terms. If we have enough dots mm -hmm. with enough data on those dots, a picture emerges of what the oceanography is, uh, is like out there. We sample krill and fish at depth using a tucker trawl. Krill and fish caught in the net are washed down into the cod end. All contents are stored to be sorted later in the lab where fish, krill, and other larger zooplankton are identified to species, counted, separated by age, sexed, and measured. Tucker trawl samples provide important information on the biology of krill and fish and are used to ground truth hydroacoustics and estimate biomass. In terms of wildlife uh, on the surface or around that area, did you, did you see any concentrations uh, uh, that you, you can tell us about? Yeah, we did see a lot of fin whales, and that's oh. the second largest whale in the world, right behind the blue whale. And so tons of that, which was fantastic. We also saw tons of seabirds, Cassin's auklets, and a few other species. But mm -hmm. we did notice a few patterns, and this is preliminary, but mm -hmm. we did notice a few patterns that were closer to the seamount. More of the whales seemed to be on the northwestern side, and the wow. birds seemed to be on the southeastern side. We mm -hmm. don't have an explanation for that yet. Mm -hmm. It could be random. Mm -hmm. But the more that we go out there, and the more yes. often we sample, mm -hmm. the more uh, of a picture we're going to be able to paint. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm almost afraid to ask you this, but do you have any data on the microplastics uh, uh, study? or uh, Not anything concrete other mm -hmm. than a couple of the samples that we did tow. I did physically see pieces of plastic okay. in the sample, which is okay. amazing. We're way offshore and yes. plastics are out there, but I think a lot of people have heard about the plastic garbage patch in yes. the middle of the Pacific. That's even more remote, but that's where a lot of the stuff that we're putting in the oceans is getting concentrated, unfortunately. And so we want to understand um, what is that kind of concentration in our own sanctuary. Yeah, and things like plastic do not break down. Yeah. They it's stay there and, and, and inhabit the habitat. So um, when, when in terms of chemicals, did you, did, did you, did you find anything, uh, the, in the mm -hmm. inorganics that you were talking about, the pesky yeah, no, ones? So that was sent off to a company that does the testing okay. for us. And so that's going to be a, several months until sure, those sure. results are that's known. That's data. Yeah. And you had mentioned something about going back in October, mm -hmm. and, and that's Gosh, that's next month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny in, in this in this world of science. Sometimes you know it's 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 it rains or it pours, right? right. We haven't had access to these wonderful offshore research uh, 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 opportunities for a while, mm -hmm. and now suddenly we have back-to-back -back cruises. So Fantastic. we do this October. In fact, in just three weeks, we're going to be heading out to the Davidson again. Mm -hmm. But instead of studying the surface and the water column, we're mm -hmm. actually sending two robots, remotely operated vehicles, oh. down to the seamount. 
Okay. Now we have been there a few times mm -hmm. with Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Yes. But we have not been out there in more than 10 years That's to right. see what's down there. Mm -hmm. This opportunity is going to be with the Ocean Exploration Trust, which is run by Dr. Bob Ballard. And oh. He's the, the, the man who discovered the Titanic back yes. in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And so this is a wonderful opportunity. OET is working with sanctuaries and doing a bunch of cruises over a three year uh, period. And so Monterey Bay Sanctuary has this particular opportunity in the fall. And I am very excited. I'm the lead scientist on this cruise. Oh. And so I'm in the middle of designing a bunch of this work, but we're really, really excited to not only re revisit the seamount, yes. but there's this big rocky area to the southeast that's never been seen by human eyes. And so we're gonna be exploring that first and see what we get. So you, have, you know that it's there because you have pictures of it, but you Well, we have pictures of the seen. bottom, yeah, right. of sonar, the shape sonar. of the seafloor. Sonar. Right? Right? Right. We don't know what's there. Okay. So that's the whole point of this is it's exploration. And this is with, with the Ballard Group and yeah. is it with the Nautilus? It is. It's on oh. the exploration vessel Nautilus. That's oh, correct. That is so wonderful. Yeah. So this time, Noah Shimada in October, the Nautilus, mm -hmm. and all going on in one of the most highly researched areas of ocean in the world. Yeah, well, what's amazing about it is a seamount, the Davidson Seamount is one of the largest seamounts on the Pacific West Coast. Oh. It's also one of the most researched seamounts in the world, but overall, it's been visited maybe seven or eight times. So it gives you an idea of, of you know, we don't know much more about the seamount. In fact, we might know less about the seamount than we do about the moon. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the problem with the deep sea research, but we're here trying uh, to do our best. And you keep doing that, Chad, and, and, and I, what, what motivates you? What, 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 what gets you up in the morning, gets you going about the, the ocean? Yeah, you know, it, when, I was a, when I was a child, I wanted to be either a paleontologist, a doctor, or marine biologist. Oh. And one of the things that really drew me to marine science was mm -hmm. really, it was more, more of a fear of the unknown. That may sound a little weird to some people, mm -mm. but as a kid at the boardwalk, let's say, I, I didn't want to get in past my waist because I didn't know what was out there. So I thought the solution to that problem was, well, why don't I learn what's out there instead of being afraid of the unknown? I think mm -hmm. a lot of society is afraid of the unknown, and you need to be able to tackle those challenges by learning. And the more I got into it, the more I was just fascinated by marine research. And then to understand through that education on how critical and important the oceans are mm -hmm. to everyone, even in the middle of the country in Kansas, in mm -hmm. terms of it produces most of the oxygen that we breathe, it drives the weather, and it certainly... Uh, is connected to our food source and really our health and kind of the vibrancy of not just human health but the, the U.S. economy as well. So I think it's really, really important for us to understand more and more, uh, especially in, in the wake of, of climate change and things going on like that right mm -hmm. now, of how we are not only affecting the oceans but how the oceans are affecting us. And, 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 and that's so true because it, it affects everything we do and, and, and it's everywhere. Uh, and the, the, the latest thing that really fascinates me is what they're doing in the, the extreme environments um, uh, looking at, at metabolisms of organisms yeah. there for, for you know, to, to develop uh, a drug, prescription drugs. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing that mm -hmm. they can look at, at those environments and those animals. Do you, do you know, have you read about that? Read I about have, that I, I mean, certainly it's my just, area of expertise, but definitely know enough to, to know that they're going to, you know, geysers for thermophilic, uh, they call them, that's heat loving mm -hmm. bacteria in, in hydrothermal vents in the ocean and mm -hmm. uh, areas that are way under ice in Siberia. I mean, mm -hmm. they're finding some very, very remote um, and very, uh, what do you call it, exposed uh, 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 organisms in extreme environments. They're yes. called extremophiles, I think. Oh. And so that kind of connects to also like mm -hmm. uh, extraterrestrial uh, life. Maybe one day those principles that we're discovering here might connect to finding life in the strangest and most extreme of environments in space. Yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah. I love that. It's, the ocean is the space of Earth. <laughs> it is. It really is. <laughs> yeah. And, and very, very, we, we have not explored. If, if you could guess, mm -hmm. what fraction of the ocean have, have we explored? Oh, it's, it's, it's less than 1%. Less than yeah, 1%. Yeah, in fact, the oceans, uh, it, uh, basically, as, uh, when you look at volume of the oceans, mm -hmm. contain about 98 to 99% of all living space on Earth. What does, okay, and that's so, an incredible statistic. What do you mean by living space right. on Earth? So obviously the, um, the Earth is about two-thirds water okay. or so. So mm -hmm. you think, oh, it's two-thirds. It should be around 67%. Well, oceans are three-dimensional. And as we know through all our research, and I think it's fairly common knowledge, that there are 
plankton in basically 100% of that water column. So there's life throughout the entire square inch or almost every square inch of the entire oceans, right? Ah. But on land, aside from birds that temporarily fly, mm -hmm. nothing lives in the air except maybe so for bacteria and a few things like that. So right. when you really look at the inhabitable space of Earth, mm -hmm. there's so much more space that's available in the oceans. And that's why there's so much more productivity and life in the oceans than on land because we're all landlocked. Even birds are landlocked pretty right. much. You know, right. they're going to be going back to their nests mm -hmm. and living on the ground. While in the ocean, hey man, you're floating. Okay, <laughs> and, and 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 like you said, it's three dimensional. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of depth involved in that too, and yeah. all that space is full of life, living space. I'd never heard that before, and I found it just, uh, you know, really, really, really uh, uh, blew it blew me away. Yeah, it's and crazy now that you've explained it. It makes all the sense in the world. Biomass. Yeah, we are a water, water world, really. W why? Okay, and that's why it's important. <laughs> and and if you could uh, if you could change anything about the sanctuary, uh, mm -hmm. if you could wave a magic wand, what would you do? That's a great question. I, there's a lot of things that I would think about globally, but one where I'm just thinking about the sanctuary, mm -hmm. the one thing I wish I could change is probably pollution. Mm -hmm. I think human impacts to the sanctuary are, are pretty strong, and I'm not trying to paint a picture of doom and gloom at all. No. The sanctuary is still in relatively good shape. Yes. But there is a lot of pollution going into the oceans. Mm -hmm. Microplastics, like we just talked about, mm -hmm. a lot of agricultural runoff, a lot of sewer spills like the one we had last year. Yes. Uh, a lot of things like that that do affect human health, it close beaches, they elevate bacteria content, mm -hmm. they affect the food chain. <laughs> yeah, right. A lot um, of things. They, they cause harmful algal blooms which can go up the chain of marine mammals and sea otter die-offs. That kind of stuff. I just wish humans had less of an impact on the sanctuary itself. But, mm -hmm. you know, overall we're still doing pretty well. Chad, and, and I'm sorry for springing this on you, but uh, <laughs> I was surprised and I didn't know that you, you, you do some things over at the aquarium, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about the show that you're going to be going to. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's funny. A lot of people say, oh, you work for the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Well, I know, Monterey Bay Aquarium, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, they're, they're, they kind of start with the same name. Mm -hmm. They are different, but we really do work closely together. However, I am a volunteer diver at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so every couple of weeks, I'm part of this team that goes in on the full face mask mm -hmm. and uh, have a live interactive show with the kids and, and the crowd in front of the kelp forest tank. So I go down with a bucket of fish and, and feed all the other fishes in there mm -hmm. and do about a 15 minute show uh, just talking with a guide about um, all sorts of stuff. About wow. marine. I love it. I love it. It's yeah. fantastic. And, and, and you're educating uh, you're, you're educating the people who are there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that. What a what a great gig! Yeah, man. talk about the fish, and it's a good opportunity to talk about the sanctuary too. And you're right there in the environment. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And and have you uh, do you visit the Santa Cruz uh, much? The the exploration center. You ever get up there? Yeah, exploration center, which opened, I guess, what in 2012 now. Gosh, mm -hmm. it's been open six years. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I actually a lot of the work that we've done because I do a lot of underwater photography and Gosh. video work over the years, mm -hmm. and then a lot of the development of the original exhibits there. I had a big hand in. So a lot of uh, my photos and my colleagues' photos mm -hmm. are still up there today. Okay. Uh, so it's fantastic. In fact, even me and my daughter, who thir turns 13 today, by the way. Happy birthday. Um, <laughs> as a four-year-old, we're painted, we're, we're photographed on a mural behind the tide pool still. Oh, we're still man, there you are. <laughs> That's wonderful. It's, it's a really cool thing. So really? I, I, I'd encourage go? people to visit the Exploration Center in Santa Cruz. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you're down south, you can go down to the, the there's, there's one in Cambria, in Cambria. also. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to somebody else uh, uh, in Southern California last night uh, who was talking to me about the Channel Island Sanctuary, which is further down the coast. And yep. we're really blessed around here because uh, it's, it starts down Channel Islands, goes all the way up to what, Olympic and Coast? Yeah, we have coast? five West Coast sanctuaries, uh, Olympic in Washington, and we have four in California, three of them being contiguous with mm -hmm. Greater Fairlands, Cordell Bank, Monterey, and then like you said, skipping south to Channel Islands. Chad, have you done any diving up uh, in the in the Farallons or Cordell Bank area? I, I have done some off the Sonoma Coast, kind of Point Arena and mm -hmm. south, and so a, a few years ago, and mm -hmm. my colleague has been doing more lately. We just expanded Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. And so uh, we're looking, of course, there's a big problem up there with uh, uh, the kelp die-off yes. and the urchins exploding. And yes. So part of that work was related to that. Okay. Yeah. And, that is, and, and to explain that, the, the purple urchins... Yeah, the purple urchins the are the main culprit. Yeah. Okay, and they're eating the kelp. It's a complex right. kind of a story, mm -hmm. uh, but in a kind of a nutshell, mm -hmm. is it's we had some warming of the oceans uh, from El Nino. Mm -hmm. We also had this thing called the blob, which was a large warm patch unrelated to El Nino. Mm -hmm. And kelp needs to have temperate temperatures, basically mild temperatures, and uh, fairly cold actually. 
uh, it got a little too warm. A lot of that kelp died off. And then you exacerbate that with an explosion, a high recruitment of urchins. Mm -hmm. So it was just kind of like the stars aligned in a poor way for kelp. Right. So then whatever kelp was left was just decimated by the urchins, which mm -hmm. eat kelp and other right. algae. Right. And so now, because those populations are so large, it's kind of preventing new recruitment of new kelp. So mm -hmm. I'm sure this cycle will end at some point, but yeah. right now they're, mm -hmm. they're having problems up there. Yeah. Bring in the otters. Yeah. <laughs> don't, they, don't they love urchins? I know, if we could just train otters and, and make them go do that. Now, we're having some similar, uh, similar patchy problems down here. It's not as bad mm -hmm. as the North Coast, but there are some areas I used to dive of just complete kelp forests, which are just what we call urchin barrens now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Quite remarkable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Chad, thank you so much for showing up. And you will come back to the program, please, because oh, yeah. there's so many things we, we, we need to talk about, okay? Yeah, well, hopefully we discover a lot of cool stuff in October. You've probably heard of the Pacific Garbage Patch and other plastic debris in the ocean, but have you heard of microplastics? When larger plastic debris, like this, breaks down in the ocean, it degrades into microplastics. Pesticides and other chemicals can be absorbed from the water into the microplastics, and animals that eat these microplastics can move the chemicals up the food chain, eventually affecting humans who eat seafood and other fish. Our study has set out to look at different areas of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary to look at the densities of plastics. We're looking at areas such as near rivers and near sewer outfalls to see where the plastics come from and where they concentrate. We deploy our manta net off the side of the boat, going about two knots, and leave it in the water for about half an hour, using a flow meter to determine the exact distance traveled. After retrieving the net, we rinse everything collected out of the cod end and into sample jars for later detailed processing in the lab. During the deployment, collection, and retrieval, detailed notes are taken regarding the location and other important factors such as sea conditions. After collecting our samples, we have to analyze what we found. Because not all microplastics are visible to the naked eye, we have to use a microscope. Microplastics are classified by five types. Fragments, films, pellets, filaments, and foam. We are still analyzing our data. But past studies have shown that filaments from clothes are in higher concentration near sewer outfalls. We also expect to find more microplastics where ocean currents congregate biological material. So what can you do to help with this global issue? First, you should limit your use of single-use plastic products, such as water bottles and plastic bags, and recycle them when you can. Also make sure you dispose of your trash properly so it doesn't end up in the ocean. And lastly, help with your local beach cleanups and pick up trash when you see it on the beach. Have you seen what's happening in your sanctuary lately?